it's hard to emote even how how relieving it is to this member of the band you know that it's it's uh an end of an era you know i look at it like again talking about that kid with wonder and awe you know i i haven't lost that even with godsmack i'm still i had you know so much emotion over the whole camaraderie of being in the band i don't care whose song it is you know and I've been lucky to be in a band with these three guys that are just so dedicated and committed to something. And I feel like really, you know, blessed and honored to uh, have have been involved. But I'm looking forward to having freedom. And, you know, I always tell people, you know, like one of the main reasons I, I wanted to be a rock star when I was growing up is because I thought you didn't have a boss. And then in the end of the day, I picked drums and I had a boss and I've always had a boss, right? And so I never felt like a rock star. (laughs) So, you know, maybe that's why everybody's like, yeah, you don't act like a rock star because I don't fucking feel like a rock star. You know what I mean? I, I don't know. Ladies and gentlemen, the acid's just about to hit. You're welcome. This week, we're here with our I don't want to say our favorite ever, but maybe he's our favorite ever. Person. Just person, not even guest. Person. Collectively. He's a great drummer. He's got a number one hit. I think he beat this band called Metallica at the, the Billboard charts, whatever. He's in a band called Godsmack. They're pretty big. He might not be able to get tickets because they're a big deal. His name is Shannon Larkin, and he's my friend. Shannon, how are you? I am doing great. A lot has changed since I've last been on 2020. And uh, we've bonded in many ways. We're all real life friends. We're real life friends. All four of us. Yeah, in real yes. life. Yeah. We are friends now. And it's, so it's a wonderful thing coming back on this show. Uh, and, you know, knowing you guys. Yeah, it's a different perspective when you know how crazy we are in real life <laughs> as opposed yeah. to just on the show. <laughs> You're also technically a uh, executive producer on this show, so... Yeah, you should right. feel welcome anytime. <laughs> uh, I feel welcome. That's for sure. Well, we, first thing we got to talk about is is your outfit. I'm very um, in love with the uh, the whole holiday thing. I want. I don't care uh, really about Christians, <laughs> but I love Christmas. You don't say with the giant <laughs> pentagram in the middle of the room, like. <laughs> 25 feet that way. And I love you, you Jew, you beautiful Jew, you. <laughs> well, I the funny part is, I, I, I feel like you only had me join your band so I could be the brunt of a joke. So, no, like, it's, it's fine. Not joke. It's not a joke. No, but you need, you called me, you're like, I needed the Jew so we could have the Jew and the, the, the right. sorcerer that is Shannon, whatever yeah, Shane is, who knows what he's doing. No, I, I got it, man. So, on vocals, Shane Hall. And he's a Taoist. And then on drums, Shannon Larkin. I'm an occultist. On guitar, Terry Carter, Christian. On bass, Brian Carpenter, bass god, a mystic. And then Benny Goodman, the Jew. You guys got it all covered. What a nice, eclectic, perfect round of of religious uh, vomit. <laughs> is I'm, I'm fascinated by the the Taoism side because I, I remember like several years ago I discovered this series of books that was like Winnie the Pooh but with all of the Taoists the Tao of Pooh the Tao of Pooh called. and the Dove of Piglet and I read all those and I'm like wow this is actually a really fascinating outlook on life and you know because we're brought up with religion like the standard religions like Christianity and Judaism and stuff that is like what you learn in school, but then there are all these other things that are going on on the side and it's just kind of like, all right, we'll go figure that out yourself. So that's, that's really interesting to have a band where you've got like all of these different points of view represented. That's so unique in my opinion. Yeah, it certainly is. And, and we're, I like it because, you know, we all are deep people and we can talk like I can talk to Terry, who's a Christian about, all my beliefs and it doesn't offend him and he can well i know about christianity i mean i grew up irish catholic you know and so until i was 16 i I was i had to go to church like that was a rule 
in my family life, you know? Going to church, boy, I go to church every <laughs> Sunday. And, uh, and then when I was 16, my cool dad said, you know, you're 16, because I bitched about it too. I was like, it wasn't even a religion thing. It was I wanted to watch the football, you know? And so, <laughs> I, you know, I'm church and the football. football. Yeah, what the hell? Sunday's for football, not Jesus, you know? And so, <laughs> you know, that was my, my stance. And so finally my dad said, look, you know, I hope you remain, you know, a, a, a spiritual person, but you're 16. You don't have to go to church anymore. You can choose your own path. And I, and that was the coolest thing. You know, my dad was a very, very, he was my hero. Very special dude, rad dude. <clears throat> you know, uh, but he taught me, he taught me so many great things like that, that I took to heart. Like, oh, just so many. Anyway, my dad, bless him. I, you know, I get well, nostalgic uh, about my family around Christmas, you know. Uh, same. No, that's, but it's great for you to share those things. Cause I, I love hearing those sides of, of people and like their background. And I, that's super cool. Cause I feel like, especially in Christianity, there's a lot of pressure to like continue on with it. And I think to have the freedom at the, at a certain age to go on and, you know, just find your own beliefs and find your own thing is like, that's, that's immensely powerful. I think to be given that freedom, you know, from well, someone who is a practice. That's, that right there is what Shannon and I have in common because when we were, you know, recording, we all went down to Florida um, and worked on the apocalypse, the new apocalypse blues revival record, which we can all say here kicks fucking ass. Just so everyone knows, yeah. it's coming, <laughs> it's coming, it's coming, baby. But in between the one take Larkin over there, and by one take Larkin, I mean he would literally, literally just sit there, <laughs> just you could just see him into it. I would teach him like the the uh, the Hebrew alphabet. He'd be like, you know, the Hebrew alphabet. And, and then he'd tell me about the Tetragrammaton, which I thought was Tetragrammaton. I don't know. But we're talking about the four letters that represent the name that is God. And he and I talk about these philosophical things. And I've read all these nerdy books for years thinking nobody cared. Meanwhile, Shannon has a whole library at his house of first edition mystic and occult books of Aleister Crowley and all these things. And he knows all of it. And it's wonderful to hear him talk about it because it's it's he's chosen to learn these things as opposed to just having it ingrained every Sunday. Can't go to football. Must love Jesus. That's such a great point, man. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I respect uh, parents and I'm a parent. I have a 24 year old and I did the same thing. I took my dad's advice and I told her when I thought she was mature enough, it was around between 16 and 18, you know, uh, and I, but I, of course I never, made her go to church or anything like that. But, you know, uh, my ex-wife, you know, was a Christian. And so she was pretty much raised, you know, like not a church. We weren't church Christians, but and the whole time, you know, I she, my wife, my ex-wife accepted also uh, my beliefs, you know, and but wanted uh, our daughter be, to be raised in a Christian way, put it that way, which meant, you know, God, Christmas, all that stuff. I, I will say I was very excited, Shannon, when I went online. I'm friends with Heather, his lovely girl walking around the back. And um, I posted a picture of uh, Shannon in front of their house with a giant, huge, like Santa, like a blow up thing, which by the way, as a Jew, I now have, I'm, I'm trying to beat my street in Christmas. We bought reindeers and all kinds. Of, it's great. There's lights everywhere. But Shannon has one Christmas with this. How tall is that giant Santa in the front of your house? It's, blow up it's thing. literally uh, 12 and a half feet tall. 12 and a half feet I'm tall. And, and uh, But the cool part is it's, <laughs> it's like semi-circular, you know, so it, it like his, he's like up on his hands. If you haven't seen it, Siobhan. And it, so it goes over my driveway door and then Santa's head like sits over my garage door. And so I'm going to take a picture car, of this and send it to Corey to. Yeah. My car, uh, my car fits through it so I can pull it in and out of Santa. <laughs> well, the irony is, is, is that you have shrubbery all around your house. Can your neighbors even see you? So like, it's like when I pull in my garage, it's like pulling into the bowels of Santa. <laughs> It's not for the neighbors, Ben. It's just for it's for Shannon. It's 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 purely no, for neighbors, his enjoyment. Can see it. Yeah, you could probably see it from when you're landing at RSW. 
You probably <laughs> see it from there. I don't know. It's this big giant Santa. No, it's not that big. But then Heather got a uh, a, a turtle, also like that the blow up one. But it's only like the size of a Volkswagen. It's not that that ridiculous. Only the size. It's still of a pretty big. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. It's like the size of a uh, pit bull or something. Is it bad that I, it's really hard to tell if you're kidding or not? Because it wouldn't surprise me in the very least if you had a, a <laughs> I know, turtle the size of a Volkswagen. <laughs> That's what happens when you know crazy folks. You know, when they say things, you're like, well, is he serious? I don't know. Well, he could be. <laughs> There's the question. Well, is he? Well, he well, could to be. Paint a, to, to paint a picture for people, when you go to Shannon Larkin's house, if you have the luxury uh, of going to Shannon's actual place at night, you might as well be peeking on acid on, and, and walk, going to a Vincent Van Gogh immersive experience because there's just lights there's tiki huts, there's koi fish, there's all types of amphibians and reptiles, some turtles, things that look like turtles, but they're not actually turtles. Uh, there's a chair that might eat you if you sit in it. It's the crazy stuff everywhere. And then there's like psychedelic pictures of beetles and Bowie. It's, it's, he's a madman across the water. No, man, I, I, it's like a, a, a song, you know, you're living, I get to live like exactly how I picture a song should sound. That's so interesting. It's, it's like it's like synesthesia. People that like hear colors or see sounds. Okay, t- tell us about that. That's, I, I think that's a really cool It's, it's Donovan. He plays Donovan every morning. That's the guy <laughs> that he gets to send to. Donovan. Have you heard Donovan, Siobhan? No. Oh, well, I'll tell you about Donovan. Donovan's Brad. All right, but... And, and you got to hear certain songs, you know. And like probably... On each of his records, there's, uh, you know, probably four great songs. And then it's some folky, dilly crap that I don't really dig. But when he lands with the band and it's some psychedelic sound and shit, I love it. So anyway, in his lyrics, he was like a poet. He was rad. So, but uh, to Siobhan's question, let's all, wait, first, let's all praise Donovan real quick. Donovan. We praise Donovan. Ah. And now he's this old dude and he, had, he let his hair grow real long and he paints a third eye on his forehead and shit. I'm telling you, Donovan, uh, his last record <laughs> with Rick Rubin, he did his last record with. No shit. It was a flop too. I could have, I was like, Rick Rubin, I, he probably wasn't even there. He does that shit, you know? Because this, no, man. He didn't even use percussion like on this Donovan record. I'm like, Jesus, did you do any research, Ricky? But uh, so he's like, I did. I found all the pizza places within four miles of Donovan. Yeah, and all the porn, all the porn <laughs> sites, all the local porn sites. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, turn the kick drum up. So, <laughs> uh, oh, Siobhan, right. So the sound and color thing is interesting because one of my favorite bands, Alabama Shakes. You heard them? Oh my god. I have not. What have you guys been, Corey? Have you been? Yeah. Okay. I have, yeah. Oh my god! I am yeah. very much out of the loop on a lot of very cool There's things. There's a girl named Brittany <laughs> Howard is the singer's name, and it's 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 like blues, rock, uh, classic rock, but she actually has, uh, I guess you, I, you couldn't call. It, I guess you call it a blessing, because she can see she sees color yeah. when she hears sound. So even mm-hmm. as a singer, she's like she can tell if she's out of pitch. From this, the color of her nose. Yeah, well, I, I said I said this back in the day that what Franz Liszt, when he used to conduct, used to say that it wasn't purple enough because he would see colors. And um, yeah, could you imagine like when things weren't right, they weren't purple enough. But you listen to Hungarian Rhapsody, you know that crazy. When I used to watch Roger Rabbit and I saw Donald Duck and uh, you know they go back and forth on the piano. You're like, that's not even real. And then you actually find out as an adult that that's an actual real piano piece by a crazy dude that created progressive music. And he saw colors because he was so out there and so next level that he could see colors. Uh, People think I'm crazy when I said, no, the singer for Alabama Shakes actually sees sound. Anyway, their second record, Siobhan, you, you must hear it's called Sound and Color. And I can't even believe that you haven't heard this woman and, you know, listen, you know, she's no looker or whatever, 
But when she opens her mouth, my God, she's the sexiest thing ever. And probably my favorite female vocalist since Janis Joplin blew my That's mind. Amazing. But anyway, like I can't say it more about getting Alabama Shakes sound and color. Everyone watching this, Jesus, if you don't yeah. have that, like you missed the best record of 2020 or 2020, I think it came out or 2019, maybe. No, 2018. Okay, so it's recent. Might have been 2018. Well, yeah, it, it, you know, nothing's recent after like the pandemic. I don't know. It's like I now all time has got weird. Like I'm missing a couple <laughs> yeah. years of like what my normal life would have been. You know, when when did when did yeah. David Bowie die? Was it what 18? Because that's when Black yeah, Star it, came out. And that, it was 2018. I knew it was either that or 2019. It was 2016. It been, Shut 20, up! 2016? Holy shit, he's been gone for that long? Because I was going to say that if you guys don't know how good your, your, his taste is, he made me sit down and listen to the Black Star record from David Bowie, and I was ashamed that I had it, let it into my heart. It's literally well, one of the greatest records. Well, then I listened to it with you guys, and I couldn't believe it. And since then, I have told everybody else that people that listen to Bowie, and a lot of them haven't listened to that record. And I'm like, that it literally blew my mind just to sit and listen to it at your house, Shannon. I was like, wow, this is nuts. That's right. We sat you down and said, you have to listen to this. <laughs> That's right. I sat, I sat Benny down, and we sat there and listened to it. And I swear, we were crying. I was crying. Like I, I might have been too. under the influence of some crazy stuff, but like literally, because the whole time, yeah. okay, so when Shannon d plays this record, he explains to you kind of quietly in between with the lulls of the song, like, this is when he told them that he was going to die. <laughs> this, is when, this is when he says he's going to give it all away, but like it's from his perspective. Just listen. And then he'll mouth every lyric to it so that you, if you don't know what's going on, you can just look at his, you can read his lips. And the lyrics to this record are crazy. I don't listen to lyrics. I don't internalize lyrics. But when you have Shannon Larkin looking at you going and mouthing it, it's like, how crazy is it that he's saying insert anything from that record? And you're like, I didn't know that. But right. it is crazy now that you mentioned it. Because it sounds like he's talking to you from the dead. So maybe if you're under, I don't know, maybe you're tripping on shrooms or something. You think David Bowie's actually calling your mind when you listen to that record. It's weird having the chance to work with you um, on the Apocalypse Blues Revival record and then, you know, getting to hang out and, and talking music uh, when we were down there in Florida, uh, your uh, perspective on music and appreciation of music is on a level that I, I envy because it's one of those things where I feel like uh, because of my career path and doing the engineering and producing thing, I can never look at music uh, with the depth and like perspective that you get because you're so um, moved by like each element uh, in like a very emotional way that I find myself always being too calculated. I'm like, oh, that snare has got a little too much 200 hertz in there. <laughs> but when you were, you were playing music and describing it to us, and especially your own music, it's, it's incredible. Can you talk about the way that you, you know, internalize music that, that not only that you've written, but that you get to listen to like these, these artists like Bowie and, and Donovan? Yeah, it becomes, to me, I think it's two words, wonder and awe. And, you know, like when you first heard music and I can remember it, you know, not the exact first time, but when, I, when music came into my life and I realized I really liked it. And it was before I did realize that I wanted to do it. You know, I just liked music. I liked when my parents would play records and I would go down there instead of watch TV with my parents and listen to music, you know. And so I think it's, uh, it's one of those things where at that point in your life when you, when you realize how much you love music, you're, it's wonder. And all this is before you even figured out that, wow, I can pick up a, a guitar and learn how to do that or dr pick up drumsticks or start singing. Before that point, it's wonder and all. Like you're, it's, what's wrong, girl? Stella. It's Stella. Stella's wonder and all, too. I thought I heard something. Stella. <laughs> Hi, Stella. She's, Hi, she's standing there staring at me as I'm trying to explain wonder and all. But, uh, <laughs> she's looking at you and wondering all. Yeah. what you're talking yeah, about. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go outside. But uh, so anyway, 
that's how I try and stay as passionate as I am about music is try and retain that wonder and awe that I felt when I, when I first was invaded by music. It invaded me and, and took me over. I die if I don't do music. And so it's that intense to me and that, that real, I don't give a fuck, you know, about the fame and fortune. I, I am so happy to have made money. I have money from the Godsmack thing, you know, and I'm just so happy that I can be a musician. Like, you know, you talk about my house and it's trippy and everything, but it's a small house and it's very beneath my means. I, I don't, I, I feel like when I talk about my house being like a song, I wanted to create like every different room has not only drums in it, you know, but different colors, vibrancy, vitality, you know, darkness and light in a house. So I try and do that in my songs too. I make each song have moments. And I think, again, like, you know, walking through my house, like I always told Benny, you know, in, in my band, you know, it's like, I think a great song is a song that has moments. And it could be that one moment even, you know, where that one line gets you. And that's why it's a hit, because it has that earworm and, and it's that moment. But it could be a lead or it could be a key part or a drum fill. You know, if you listen to, you know, the, all the greatest songs, they have many moments. Like a song like Tom Sawyer by Rush, you know, the moment that everybody in the arena uh, air drums along to is Neil Peart's, you know, fills. Da -da 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 there it is, right? And that song, but that also had a great verse, great chorus. It's in a great key. It's just a great song. But the moment to me was the drum solo part, the drum fill part. So, you know, obviously we don't have drum fills in the apocalypse music like that or something, but we have moments in every single song, I feel. And so there's where, I don't know, if we're talking about like the depth of my passion, it's like the air around me, you know? And it's, but everyone could be like me, you know, if you love music, everyone could be like me. I'm blessed to, you know, like I said, I can, I have the luxury of being able to create my world and my atmosphere and my vibe that I can live in. That's why, you know, touring, the only part that I really love is the part on stage, you know, everything else, the traveling and sightseeing and everything that I used to find enjoyable. I don't really look forward to it anymore, you know, because I have this song I'm living in. That's amazing. Yeah, it's like, I mean, you really encompass it in your whole life. I mean, it's a way of being. I think you're right. It's, um, it's your how you sustain yourself. It's your life. It's what you breathe in. It's what you want to wake up to every day. And the theme carries whether it's the way you live your life or the way you write a song or the way you perform on stage or what you go into music for. I mean, it's all for the same reason, you know. I bet you one night Shannon woke up and thought, I was a salamander in my dream. If I could only make the perfect terrarium for myself, if I am the salamander, this is where I shall live and it shall be a song. And that's where you live now. You were a salamander in another dream, man. <laughs> I'll tell you this, man. If I if I had the money, all the money in the world, I I could just go in a room with Benny, Terry, Brian, and Shane and make my place, you know, recordable like Benny's going to help me do a studio it and uh Corey too we're, we're dragging Corey I, we need him drag Corey in too and then have special guest stars like Siobhan come in and help but just and just make music for the rest of my life like you know be damned all the releasing and the I mean I want people to hear this I really do I really believe in this and I love it and I think that the talent level I've surrounded myself with greatness and Benny and, and Bass God, fucking Shane and Terry Carter is my guitar player is sure. Right, Corey and Benny, he's phenomenal. Oh, absolutely. Next, next, I'm, next no, level. unbelievable, unbelievable. Oh yeah, and Siobhan too. You saw it. What? So the people listening. So let's just explain this. So there's a band called the Apocalypse Blues Revival, and I don't know if we make blues. I don't know if we're reviving anything. I don't know what we're doing. But there's a guy named Terry Carter who's been in bands with Shannon all the way back to a band called Wrathchild, which if you don't know about them, 
they are one of those metal bands that influenced everybody from Pantera. Like everyone that you lo- that I loved was influenced by Shannon and Terry. And they haven't been together for years. And now Terry has come and reunited with his childhood friend. They're childhood friends. And this guy, I just have to tell you, Corey and I and Trevon, we all went down to the studio in Florida. And we've worked with some pretty incredible incredible level guitars Marty lost Friedman, symphony lost symphony.com lost symphony we worked <laughs> with jeff loomis we've had everyone from angel vivaldi crazy people yeah this dude comes and plays a slide solo on a firebird and he's like playing into the console having us turn it up to deafeningly loud volumes and Corey and i just start to laugh and he's like what what's going on we're just like that was it he's like i don't, I don't even like that okay because he's it, that incredible. Like Shannon says to everybody, oh yeah, this guy's the greatest. And it's like, it's hard to believe someone could be as good as Shannon because you're the greatest hype man. You're like Macho Man Randy Savage. You're like Hogan, Terry Carter. But this guy literally is what Macho Man Randy Savage says he's going to do to Hogan on guitar. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, it was, I didn't even have to. Macho Man outs too much because I had him on those those early demos when I when I first did Skinny and realized that song Skinny and a Mushroom Fairy off our upcoming record Snake Charmer that'll be next year sometime uh, on whatever label with you know whoever. Siobhan's the first us. thing you hear on the record if that's the case. By the way, <laughs> it is. It is. It'll be Siobhan's and, uh, violin is the first thing you hear on the yeah, new record. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sound right away it's a beautiful record i'm so proud of it more proud of it than anything i'm proud of the new godsmack record by the way it's just i can't wait number for one record. that little yeah, band well, that that thing yeah we're number one motherfuckers it's uh can, it's I, can I just tell you how i sent my mom a something from metal injection saying that metallica a band that if you come down to my studio i probably have 300 framed metallica pictures and autographs of every one of them Came out with their first record, their first, excuse me, single in like eight years or something. And you would think, because it's Metallica who sell out two stadium dates in a row, like, that they would be number one. No. Five weeks, Shannon and the Godsmackers have sat at number one with their song Surrender. And then you'd think Metallica with fresh new energy after eight years would knock you fuckers off. No! No, said Shannon and Sully and all those guys and the Godsmackers. You guys are still number one. So can we just say congratulations, dude? Like, you've literally blown my mind. I had to send that to my mom. She's like, why does this matter? I said, that's Shannon. He's the biggest in the world, mom. (laughs) Now she knows. Well, I'll say this, you know, they'll probably take us next week. I don't know. I think that, you know, in the real world, they they are the rightful heirs to the number one slot in hard rock. You know they deserve to be number one. Uh, if it if you know I listen to the song, Lutzy Turner. <laughs> you know I was like, wow, it's kind of an earworm. I get it, and it sounds like Motorhead. It's the best Metallica yeah. song in twenty it's, fucking years, man. Yeah, thirty years. Thirty it's years. High, yeah. Right? James sang pretty high in that chorus, especially. I was like, "Wow!" I don't know, but uh, but is it funny now that people are getting mad? Shannon, as a drummer, people are getting mad that Lars sounds quantized and his drums seem sampled. And do we not remember Saint Anger, where they didn't couldn't even punch in crash cymbals? Yeah. People would have been mad regardless of what happened. They <laughs> honestly, there's there's too many Metallica fans, and some of yeah. them are so anti, you know, good clean production, and some of them are so anti like messy garage sounding shit that no matter what they release, if it's not, you're never going to be able to please everyone. Right. It's just, it's impossible. I think it's, it kicks ass. The guy that produced it, I guess, you know, has a hell of a resume. I can't remember all the great bands that he's worked with or whatever, but uh, I think it sounds fantastic. I heard on the radio and I was like, wow, okay, this is because, you know, I can't, I can't sit here and, and, not tell the truth that as a this is the first single surrender that i've ever said you know this is a number one hit at rock radio we got it 
You actually sat us down in your 69 Charger and said to Corey and I, yeah, dude, this is going to be a number one hit. I never say that. And then you played it. And <laughs> here we are five weeks later. Metallica still can't dethrone you. Yeah, 6-4 Impala. <laughs> Get it right, Ben. Yeah, Ben, come on. Yeah. Sorry. Know your six four Impala, baby. Rolling in my city. But uh, anyway. Wish I was a baller. About the whole thing and the Metallica thing and all the Surrender thing. You know, Surrender is a totally different set. Like Metallica's song is pretty, it's heavy. It's old, it's old school Metallica, you know what I mean? And our song is more like radio rocker. You know, it's a high energy radio rock song. And I, you know, the chorus is, is certainly catchier Sully's chorus. And I'm not judging. I didn't write either song. So I can be, I can sit back. I'm in the band, Godsmack, though. But I can, you know, look at it objectively. Um, and I think, you know, Surrender, it's more rock than metal. And Metallica mm -hmm. song is metal. You know, does that make sense? I don't know. Yeah, sure. absolutely. Yeah, well, sure. Load and Reload both were multi-platinum records, and at the time they were very commercially successful because they were these slick rock records that could be on more uniform radio than, say, listening yeah. to one. You know what I mean? But you're right. Like your song is way more like you could hear it on everyday radio. Whereas if Metallica came on Kiss 108, it would be really weird, and especially with that new song that kind of has that whiplash thing going for it. Yeah, I'll bring this home. If that was some new band with the song Lux Eterna, here they are, you know, uh, uh, you know, Soda Can, right? <laughs> yeah. Whatever the band is. And this is their new song, you know, Lux Eterna. That shit wouldn't be number two. <laughs> That'd be, you know, it might not even make the top 40. Who knows? But yeah, uh, for sure, especially, you know especially I mean? like any radio like that with that style. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a great song, yeah, great song, great hook, like yeah. I said. But since it's Metallica, they can do that at, at radio and put out a song that sounds like Motorhead, basically. You know, do back, do it back, do it back, do it that double bass and all that. That's some '80s shit. You know, they can do it because they ruled in the '80s. But here's the thing: at the end of the day, I mean, it's great that you're not number one. Metallica are going to sell out. Two days. They're making people go see Five Finger Death Punch one night, Pantera the next night. Divisive, I think. Uh, but you have to buy tickets to go to both nights at a 75,000 person plus venue. And they're going to sell out every single show in 2024, a year before they even step into the arena. So it's like, you know, at the end of the day, Metallica are living outside of space and time. So the fact that they're coming up with songs that make them not even come in at number one. That's great. I hope they go so heavy that they, they make number 10. Yeah, I guess that's what I was trying to say. Had they have put out a song that was, you know, not Lux Eterna, which is a super heavy, sounds like could be on their, you know, early Metallica, they'd be at number one right now. You know, like if they put Unforgiven or something like that out, you know, they would have beat us probably because... Like I said, the rightful kings to the to the number one. We would never. We were just like we were happy to get a number one because we've gotten one on every record uh, that it, since I joined. From the third record on, we've had a number one, and so being our final record, we wanted to. We really wanted a number one, you know, because you know you want to go out. We want to go out. That's our whole thing. Go out on top. You know what I mean? We don't want to keep like making records till they don't. We're not selling anymore. You know what I mean? Like Judas Absolutely. Priest. Better to burn out than fade away. Well, you know what? I I respect, I say it every time I talk about this. I totally love and respect bands like Judas Priest or Cheap Trick, even that, man, they continue to make new music and they're like literally old guys in their 70s now and still playing and touring and doing it, man. You know what I mean? And so I respect that so much. You know, the simple truth is we're not that. We're not that. And Sully's like me and Tony and Robbie, we're all four the same. And we look at it like like there was this big ass mountain, right? Like we're like, oh my God, we want to be rock stars, right? And then you you guys probably you know my my course. I didn't just get in a band and become a rock star. I put you know, I was in three different bands before I got Godsmack and put out six different records on uh, five different labels, you know, independents and majors, you know what I mean? Before I even got in Godsmack. So, you know, 
the Godsmack thing. Again, I you know I like I don't I don't want to ever come off like uh, ungrateful or egotistical when I talk about Godsmack and you know, um, so sometimes I have to pick my words carefully. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, I don't think you've ever come no, off very never egotistical come off that way. I, I don't think that's possible. <laughs> Well, I, I think you're actually the most casual person to ever go through the four number one hits you had on your last record when you came on last God. time. You're like, oh, yeah, I had that song. That was a number one. And then we released that song. And that was a number one. Yeah. And we released this song. And we, you took us through all four stages. I got to I got to tell anybody who's a Godsmack fan when you sat me down and played me the new record because we got to listen to it. Bro, if you're going to go out on top like. Between what you guys did and then Dave Fortman, our friend who's been on this show, also from Ugly Kid Joe back in the day, and still an Ugly Kid Joe, but with Shannon, of course. Dude, it sounds so good. That guy, by the way, we want to give a shout out to Dave Fortman because he actually just got himself a diamond record for Evanescence. So, yes. you know, that. Wow. I mean, how cool is that? I mean, literally, that song's playing in an elevator somewhere at least every minute of the day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's so, it, that's fantastic, you know, for 40, because, and, you know, the funny thing about it, y'all, is I thought, I thought that thing was diamond years ago. You know, I just thought it already was diamond years ago. I thought that one diamond, you know, after it came out, really, it was like a Michael Jackson thing or something. But I guess it took a while to do it. So when it was, oh my God, it might, you know, because Dave, that was a text from him on that one. That's a big one. You know, your producer, you produce a record goes diamond. Really? Like he'll get a plaque, you know, just like you get a gold or a platinum. He'll get a diamond freaking plaque <laughs> that he produced. That's pretty rad. Right. So I was really, really happy for him for that. I thought the coolest thing in his house actually was that he got the Ozzy Osbourne live and loud Pl uh, platinum records for just going on tour with Ozzy. I mean, it's cool. Like he's an ugly kid, Joe, and he's done Evanescence, but <laughs> Ozzy, dude, that's on his wall. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, and Slipknot. Those are always and cool. So it's, yeah, and, and, I mean, Slipknot, a little band called Slipknot, and the fact that you were in Ugly Kid Joe, and I didn't even realize this, gold records, like right from the beginning. You guys, yeah. I mean, before Godsmack. Well, but I didn't do the gold records. You know, I came in the band after their their gold records. And then it wasn't oh. like, you know, it wasn't like in Godsmack where, you know, the trajectory went up in Ugly Kid. I went through where the tra trajectory went down and we, you know, we put out a record on, on Polygram and it was super rad. And we had such, we toured the world, man, like relentlessly. And we were young and drinking and it was so fun. Some of the best years of my life. And, uh, but it didn't sell but like 250,000 in America and coming off of one that sold, you know, 1.7 million, that's a flop to the, to polygram records in the machine. Right. And so there it is, spit us out. And so we turned around and got an independent deal with this company, uh, called, uh, uh, I can't remember what the company, Oh, castle, castle, castle records. But, it came from this company, Castle Communication, that had they owned all of the uh, catalog to Black Sabbath and Iron Maiden and all these killer. And so, like, we not only did we get, uh, they gave us $1 million for one record, right? I mean, good job. So, so we finally, <laughs> we all, you know, clearly yeah. not recently. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, we, we couldn't even, we spent, you know, we went in Dave Fortman's studio out there in California, you know, when we were still a band and recorded our record and, you know, probably cost 20, 30 grand to make our record, you know, so we had like all this money finally. And so, and then ironically, the record came out, it was called Motel California. It's a great record. It's out there, you know, on your online and all that Spotify and all that shit. But uh, but Castle, uh, two months after the record was released, we hadn't even done a, an, a, a tour yet. And they, like, filed bankruptcy and boom, lost the whole Maiden catalog was up for sale. Everything happened, like, and we were just like, 
like lost in this mix of, they released like 10,000 of those CDs in America, physical. That's all. And they sold quick, you know, 10,000. And then and, and, and there it was the end. And we broke up. We said, man, you know, we all sat down. I remember it like, you know, and everybody just was just like, let's go and climb some other mountains, guys. You know what I mean? And, uh, but um, I went on to Amen at that point, you know, a yeah. punk band. And now you get to be reunited with uh, with Mr. Fortman on the Apocalypse Blues Revival, which is incredible. Yeah, so it's yeah, like it's, it's crazy how it all comes full circle. It certainly does. And you know the the way like Dave Fortman even ended up, you know, because what happened then? Seventeen years passed, and I was in the band Amen, made some records. Then I I got God went with Godsmack. <clears throat> and 17 years passed since the day we sat down in Santa Barbara, California and said, let's, let's break it up, man. We don't want to be that band. We, I mean, here we are, major label band. They'd sold millions. We sold, we toured the world and then went to an independent label and didn't sell. So it, you don't go, that's it. There, there's your, if you're a true musician, you know, you really have no, no chance really after that for you know to repeat success so we we when we made that decision to break up um yeah so anyway 17 years passed i was in godsmack at the time or still um for i don't know what record we were on but after 17 years so but you know like six or seven of those were amen anyway long story short Wit calls me, the singer, out of the blue and says, hey, man, so we're going to make a record. And we want it to be the five, me, Dave, Klaus, Cordell, and Wit. And I'm like, well, you know, if it's, I mean, God's back. So, you know, I can't support, but will I go in the studio and make the record with y'all and do the videos? Yeah. And so I did. And it was just an EP we did. It was called uh, Stairway to Hell. <clears throat> <laughs> And like all the records are puns on big records, right? Like, so the new record, by the way, is called Rad Wings of Destiny. I saw I that. Play, I that's played that's the most Dave Fortman thing ever. The Rad Wings of Destiny. <laughs> Rad. Yeah. Because, no, you know, Sad Wings of Destiny, obviously, Judas Priest. But, what, but what, what's, here's what's missing, though. You need Dave on the cover cooking wings because he's a great chef. He's so if you can make his too. actual sad, sad wings of destiny, rad wings that of mother, destiny. That motherfucker, yeah, he can make rad wings of destiny. Yeah, dude, that's that could be. <laughs> he could come on twenty twenty and make rad wings of destiny. That'd be awesome. <laughs> so we were talking about the God Smack, the final record. Oh what? yeah, the final record. So because that seemed to be the question that everybody asked me when I do these things. And so we're not everybody, Shannon. I know. I know. We're way more interested but, in the rad ways of destiny that, that we're going to have cooked for us by Dave Fortman. Well, what we were saying before is that you were, you, you, you know, it's climbing the mountain of getting to the top and what a lot of people, we got into the story of how you got star. there. Well, but, but all the things that yeah, happened the before thing, that and that there was a huge climb. That's true. I mean, the good thing is, is that, uh, you know, we, we, we won. You did. <laughs> you know I mean? Just don't sell like, your music catalog I, to Michael Jackson. Like we we went ahead and just won at the end, like you know, down by three, and then we won it. And so, for people that go, "Oh my God, I can't believe you know they throw it away or whatever," not make me, you know, if we ever like say say that, uh, um. Let me think of somebody really prolific, you know, like, I don't know, Quentin, Quentin Tarantino. Well, I meant a living person that would want us to write a song for their new movie, right? Nobody said, we're not saying we wouldn't go in the studio, the four of us get together, fucking put out a badass song. You know what I mean? Like we're not, or, or, you know, in 25, 26, whenever we're done with the, uh, you know, this lighting up the sky thing, uh, cycle tour then who's to say that, you know, there's not a rat of badass like radio show where Metallica's playing and they really want us to play. We'll come and play. You know what I mean? You guys want to do it on your own terms is what you're saying. Right? Yeah. And like, we don't really want to do it, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like 
but we don't want to let people down either. And we do love our fans for what it's worth, you know, that we have a loyal fan base that for fucking 20 years now that I've been with it, you know, we come out and have success. And so that's hard. That's hard for anybody to, to even grasp how hard, like people that aren't in this business don't understand how hard that fucking is. You know, it's not just music and all that. It's all everything. It's crazy. It's, it's, we live together. You know what I mean? It's like all the families and girlfriends and, and wives and this and that there's drama. That's it's like being in a family. It is. It's like some, one of those reality TV shows or whatever, especially on, on the road after, a year and a half when everything's fucking crazy and falling apart in everybody's life <laughs> for no reason. You know what I mean? It's crazy. So to be able to just, it's hard to emote even how, how relieving it is to this member of the band, you know, that it's, it's uh, an end of, of an era. You know, I look at it like, again, talking about that, that kid with wonder and awe, you know, I, I'm not, I haven't lost that even with Godsmack. I'm still, I had, you know, so much emotion over the whole camaraderie of being in the band. I don't care whose song it is, you know? And so, and I've been lucky to be in a band with these three guys that are just so dedicated and committed to something. And, I feel like really, you know, blessed and honored to uh, have have been involved, and but I'm looking forward to having freedom. And you know, I always tell people, you know, like one of the main reasons I I wanted to be a rock star when I was growing up is because I thought you didn't have a boss. And then in the end of the day, I picked drums and I had a boss, and I've always had a boss, right? And so. I never felt like a rock star. <laughs> so, you know, maybe that's why everybody's like, yeah, you don't act like a rock star because I don't fucking feel like a rock star. You know what I mean? I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't try to fucking, I don't know. Now I'll feel like a rock star in the apocalypse. You know what I mean? It's going to be a whole, just the animal of it and just being the, the, the excitement. And it's, you know, again, it was with that mountain thing. I try and use this parallel. It's like, a, you know, you see that mountain peak. It's a peak that you want to get to and say it's, Say your peak is like stadiums, right? Or your peak could be theaters. Or your, your peak could be a music teacher. You want to teach. You know what I mean? That could be your peak. And once you achieve that peak, that could, you could be like, I'm there. Well, I'm not there. You know, even though I achieved the peak, I, we went out, boom, and we didn't strike. We, we hit the home run and won. At the end, Godsmack, you know what I mean? And it's not over, like I say. But, you know, I, I have another peak. And like, say, it's it's not even just like the apocalypse. And, you know, music will always be my thing in my life. But, you know, what if I wanted to paint? Or what if I wanted to write books? You know what I mean? And that those are peaks, right? And so, but I also believe that you, to... To, to make it happen and be successful, you have to devote 100%. 100%, right? And so if I wanted to paint fucking pictures, I couldn't, I couldn't do music at that point. I can go out and play my drums for the love and sweat of it. But, you know, as far as creating music and writing songs and being in a band, I, I, if I wanted to paint, not that I do, but I, I definitely dream of pictures that I'd like to paint someday. So, you know, and, and books, I can, I really feel like if I just said, fuck the world and, and went into a uh, book writer mode, I mean, I've written books that no one has read, you know what I mean? And so anyway, and they, and they're not great, but if I took three years and just was a writer in my, in my life and became that. And, I can tell and, you exactly what you need to do. Shannon Larkin has. 10,000 <clears throat> horror films on DVD. And one night, whilst staying in his room, I was being snoopy because he has a bunch of books. I'm like, oh, let's look through Shannon's books. And you pull out these notebooks and you open them up and in serial killer handwriting and type three font, like all perfect. He'll tell you about, he has every horror film rated. 
He has like the slasher scene. He has like the, you know, how gory, like all these little ratings. Like if it was Fangoria magazine, 1993. And it's perfect. It's like all the margins are perfect. It's like whole notebooks and it's psychopathic. It's unbelievable. I think you should just scan all those in and anyone that needs to watch a horror film, they'll just know instead of IMDb, Shannon, Shannon's films.com. I would love to do a book about horror films because you know, it's, that's been a passion of mine too. But, but furthermore, like I say, it's, it's just with me, I, I just, I have no fear of dying or anything, but I do hope that I can live long enough to get to the peak after music, you know, and music is going to define me. And it's, if it's going to be written on my tombstone, it should be, you know, that this is a musician, you know, and he died happy. Yeah, no, you're, you're well on your way to, to, to peaking, I think with the, uh, with the apocalypse blues revival, I think you're, you're setting yourself up, uh, pretty nice for your post Godsmack career. And, uh, yeah, I, he's mixing so. it. I, uh, oh, yeah, yeah Corey, the songs, me, but, songs are incredible. You know, and I hope, well, thanks, man. I mean, I hope, I know that I've got the best of the best now around me and that, you know, there's five paintbrushes in the band and I can't make, like I can think of the picture, but I can't paint it, you know? And with the four guys that I have now, I don't think that, I can't even, I have new song, three new songs on the board right now that are, I, I always call my songs crazy like, you know, old habits die hard, you know what I mean? It sounds crazy at first when you first hear it or skinny. And so, but once they flesh out and then I can bring in Benny and Terry and, and Brian and Shane, it'll become what I feel are, you know, crazy good songs. And so, like I, we haven't even finished mixing this one, you know, but I have this vision already of what these songs can be. And so it, it, it fires me up and keeps me going. And I can't, you know, I, I, I can't wait to, uh, to record and a new record, but I can't wait to go play too. And so, you know, it's funny, I talk about not wanting to tour, you know, and all that, but I want to play live, you know? And so, especially with the apocalypse, just to hear those guys sing like that, hear Terry play live every night like that. Yeah. It's going to be incredible you know, create a, a vibe you know what i mean like i i feel like the next chapter of my life is going to be that and i i honestly will travel in comfort because i'm a rock star but we're not gonna i don't care about if we play clubs or whatever you know what i mean we will play we will go play well, that's what you mean by yeah. being your own boss. Is you've 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 been the guy who's been the backbone of Godsmack and Ugly Kid Joe and Candlebox and all these bands you've played with, but you've never really unabashedly been able to get your ideas out. Where you can be like, "Here's a song called Skinny and the Mushroom Fairy," and I'm going to do a bunch of drum uh, percussion here, and this is where all like the ahs and oohs, and I'm going to have effects, and you're like. What the fuck? I look, ask Corey. There's at least four or five times. He's like, do it like the demo. I'm like, no one can hear Shannon's mind. No one making the record had any idea of what anything was going to sound like other than Shannon. And all we're doing is working blindly to try to, is this it? He's like, that's great. That's it. That's it. That's it. But I allow for my guys, you and Terry and Brian, to be able, and Shane, even singing. But mainly, I'm not a singer, so but I am a musician. And so... You know, I'll be have more probably input, you know, on how I want a guitar or a keyboard to sound than I will for even a vocal. You know, I like I said, I'm I was a fan of Shane's voice on the last record in which, you know, he had a character, weird voice that, you know, as much as I love Frank Zappa. And if someone wants to say that one of my songs sounds like Frank Zappa, well, that is a huge compliment to anyone who knows music or writes songs. You know, that's a big fucking compliment. And so, but that said, I'm like, I don't, I don't want to be people to think of me or the band Apocalypse Blues Revival, I should say, in the same breath as Frank Zappa, because Frank Zappa 
you know, he wasn't, he didn't have commercial hits. He, his records were so eclectic and just out there, you know, that it was simply, you know, cult following. And so that earworms are earworms and fucking, I'm so sick of everybody sounding exactly the same. And it's, you know, I think that if people heard some of these songs and got them, man, then they could be on the radio. And that's, that's a dream. And there's a thing called alternative radio. And alternative radio played, like, if you think about it, like, and I'm not so crazy because bands like, like Lumineer, like the Lumineers, right? Or, uh, you know, even Imagine Dragons when they first came out. Those were like unique original bands that, you know, struck and the colleges started loving them first because that's how it goes. And then alternative radio plays it. Next thing you know, it's crossed over and everybody in the world goes, Imagine Dragons. They become one of the biggest bands. Yeah. But you know, and they but they didn't sound like fucking anyone else when they first came out. They actually had an original sound, you know? And so there are very few that do that these days and have an original sound and make it. So Can I you tell know, you what they were did what they did that was so smart now looking back into the Matrix? And I know Corey wants to wrap this up so we can do part two. It's the fact that Imagine Dragons came out when dubstep was really a thing. And then they decided to play it sixty beats per minute. With the and they did that really shh. And there you are, Imagine Dragon, 60 BPM. It's it's always a pleasure uh, chatting with you, Shannon, and I hope you'll hang out for part two uh, as we as we wrap up part one. But just here. hey, but remember, congrats on being number one. Yes, thank you. It feels good, man, and it's a great song by Sully Erna and Eric Ron, and uh, it's a real lyric and. The breakdown part to me was always the best part, you know, it's like, it's almost, it has two earworms in it. You know what I mean? So I'm Amazing. super proud to play it on that track. Hell yeah. So check it out. Surrender. Godsmack. It's, it's everywhere, but you can find it pretty easily. <laughs> no and, uh, it. and the full record, what's the release date? The That is uh, February something. I think it's like the second or third week of February. And we're going to put a second single out then to when the record comes out. But I don't know if I'm at liberty to tell you what, what it's called That's okay. yet. So That's all right. It'll remain a surprise. Honestly, I'm not even sure if we, if we have decided which, exactly which song is going to be the second one. But I think we, I, think we, I mean, I, have a, I know which one I want it to be. <laughs> we'll keep you apprised of any updates for sure. Uh, I on, think it's uh, safe to say, though, having heard it. It's going to be a number one. I'll say it. It's going to be the next Godsmack <laughs> single. Now, I'm predicting it right here, like Nostradamus. It's going to be number one. It's a bold prediction. I tell you ben. what, man. You know, we never had a record that had more than num one number one until the last one, which, as you all know, had four. <laughs> and so if you would have told me, you know, only six years ago that, oh, this, this second single is going to be number one, I'd be, nah, that's not going to happen. But now – after seeing it, witnessing, you know, multiple ones, I, I will go, I will say it right here online. I think it's going to be number one, too. After that, I have no clue, but I think <laughs> the next song is going to be a number one because it's a yes. good way. It's a barn burner, man. I'll say that one. Of, it's another high energy one like surrender, but it's even, it's relentless. It's more high energy. It's, it's, a, it's got an upbeat and it's super rad. Hell yeah. Yes. Well, we look forward to checking it out. And uh, Part we'll two. see Part you guys two. next week on 2020, 2020-D.com. <laughs> like and subscribe. But the fact is, the microphone in my history has shit to do with the end product. Because you can EQ the fuck out of whatever the vocal is going to be, man. Right. It's going to be down to whether did he fucking actually perform it correctly? Like, or did he give, give us something that the world can call valid and emotion, you know, like these, these things are largely more important than, than the sound or the vocal, you know, the, or the microphone and all these things. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I spent years being in the engineer world and then I spent years being against it because I don't really give a fuck what it is, man. I don't care if it's recorded through a, the dude made a four track on a, on a cassette tape. I just want to know that it's going to make sense human to human whether he can sing me the song or whether the actual lyrics even mean anything you know like those, i mean how much more important are lyrics right than a, than a yeah. they're fucking massive 
So you, you know, I'm better off telling telling a guy to change the chorus and to rewrite it than to tell him that we need to switch preamps and make it like sound fatter.